so, okay, first of all, I think that uh, in a way, I, well, let's, let's play a little bit. So I completely agree that we are in a situation in which climate change will drive and is driving migration in the world. However, let me argue for something a little bit, you know, maybe that will make you a bit uncomfortable. So let's say that maybe we should not talk about climate change migration. Why? Because for me, of course, I do agree that, you know, there is environmental disruption and people are moving. But I wonder, is really the environment, the cause, or as uh, Nimmo just said, is capitalism. So dividing nature and, the, you know, the natural and the social, you could say, you know, natural causes and social causes can be a little bit difficult. What I am trying to say is that capitalism is so embedded into nature and to in the ecosystem that today, actually, people are running away from, you know, the certification, exploitation, but it's not because they are running away from, you know, environmental disruption. They are running away from social and economic disruption affecting the ecosystems. And even as an historian, I am an historian, you know, in my free time, I, uh, I, would, I can tell you a very short story, you know, uh, which can help to, to make my point, I hope. In the 1930s, we are all familiar, I guess, with the famous crisis of the 1929, no? when Wall Street collapsed and so on and so forth. You know, the, the, in Italian, we would say il crollo di Wall Street, no, the, the, cri the economic crisis of the 1929. However, in the 1930s, there was also an ecological crisis happening in the center of the US which was called the Dust Bowl. Now, a lot of farmers were leaving the, the area in the center of the US, the Great Plains, because of these great dust storms and the drought happening there. However, and those people were called Aukis, because they were said that they were coming from Oklahoma. It was a very, you know, kind of racist uh, reasoning and labeling of these people. Anyway, so the Yankees, many times they say, you know, scholars, they say that the Yankees are the best example of climate refugees. It's true. However, I would argue that the Yankees are also the, be the best example of capitalism refugees in the very country of capitalism. Those people were running away from the dust storms but they, are, they were running away from the capitalistic organization of agriculture in the Great Plains, which produced the environmental degradation. So in this sense, I would like to, to, to challenge us and to think about, you know, uh, it's, it, it means it's our slogan, we want to change the system, not the climate. And so in this sense, this is one, one thing that I would like to say. And this is also something that can be interesting in terms of pr prophecy and, you know, prediction. For a long time, we have, been, we have been said that 250 millions will be the people uh, running away from climate change by 2050. Now, the IPCC said, you know what, actually we cannot have any prediction. It's too difficult and we don't know how many people may move. Now, why I am bringing this out? Because uh, this idea about the barbarians and the gate, this idea of the invasion of climate refugees, is also very scary, no? And I think it's very colonial. Why? First of all, because it's a prof prophecy. The idea, let's look into the future and see what will happen. Well, tell the peasants in the Philippines who lived the Yolanda Typhoon. Let tell, you know, this to the African-American trapped in New Orleans. Let tell to the indigenous people everywhere in the world that the apocalypse is something jeopardizing the future of the next generation. They will laugh. The apocalypse is not in the future, it's in the past or in the present for most of the people on earth. And it's a very colonial project, the idea of the apocalypse will jeopardize something in the future. It's a way to not recognize the injustices happening today. The fact that we are not so touched is not an excuse. And this is very true. If you think, thank you. I want to read you something that I, I found. I don't know if you are familiar with the work of the Invisible Committee. It's a very famous collective of revolutionary writers and they have published three books. In one of their books, they wrote, and I am reading from their book, Ned less to wait for a breakthrough, the revolution, the nuclear apocalypse, or a social movement. To keep waiting is madness. 
the catastrophe is not coming, it is already here. We are already within the collapse of civilization. It is within this reality that we must choose which side we are on. And I think that this is very crucial for us. And this is why I am a bit skeptical with the, you know, the projection, the apocalypse, and so on and so forth. Because I think it's very depolitic depoliticizing, difficult word for an Italian to pronounce, is a way to you know, escape the, very, the political in this. And again, the problem is not just that the environment is changing. The problem, as Nimmo said, is that some, somebody and actually, you know, the capitalistic organization of labor is getting profit out of the very death of people. This is necrocapitalism. We thought that capitalism was making, you know, profit out of life of people, and actually capitalism has found a way to make profit out of the death of people and ecosystems. And I believe that this kind of uh, the connection between necrocapitalism, racial capitalism, and the climatic crisis is very important. I, I, I think that what Nemo said about race, uh, environmental racism is crucial. The, you know, I, I, I live and work in Sweden, the best of possible world. I mean, my colleagues, they believe they live in paradise. It might be true, but because, you know, in paradise, generally, you find a lot of dead people, so it might be true. However, uh, uh, Sweden, no, they really believe it's a paradise. Okay, but the welfare in Sweden, you know, in the 80s, while Sweden was living, uh, you know, it's welfare, uh, fantastic social democracy, where a, a Swedish corporation, money corporation, was exporting toxic waste where? Guess where? In Chile. Who was in power in Chile? Pinochet. Well, because the, uh, the project of ordering, the fact that you need a dump, and a dump is a human being, and a place, it's a history, it's a memory, a place which is ordered from us. And we need, capitalists need always to produce some kind of ordering, somebody that it's not us. And it's also very funny because, you know, I am thinking about Salvini, sorry for not Italians, but we are a little bit in this, you know, m mess now. No, the problem with the ordering is that, you know, the uh, ability of capitalism is to convince the subalterns that the other is somebody else. The problem is that the wall is, of course, between the north and south. It's the Mediterranean, sure. It's the Rio Grande. In, in, the US, in, in America, in North America. However, there are a lot of walls here. There is, I mean, people coming from Taranto, they know very well that if you live in Tamburi, in the neighborhood, you are on the other side of the wall. People from the, ter the land of fires, the Terra de Fuego in Campania, they know that they are living on the other side of the wall. Because the truth is that they have told us that the problem is if you are not from here. But the reality is that the wall is a class wall, which is separating the 1% from the rest. And what is really important here is that the class struggle is not end, just they are winning. And they, are, and they have told us that it's not anymore because they are winning. And I, need, I really think that we need to go back to class struggle, to solidarity, because migration can be precisely a great opportunity to restart from there, to join forces. Because you know, I am an old guy, and I truly believe that proletarians from all countries unite is a good, good thing to do.